Hi, a warm welcome to our panelists and our in-person participants and those of you who are tuning in online. Many of you are familiar with our dialogue on the benefits of uh, peaceful uses of nuclear science technology and applications um, and the role of nuclear security. Today we have three panelists from uh, the private sector who will tell us how they are using ionizing technologies, be it machine-based irradiation, so electron beams or x-rays, uh, or source-based, so gamma irradiation um, to protect crops, uh, increase food safety, food security, food quality, and uh, open up international trade markets. Um, we also have a discussion, we'll have a discussion about the sustainability and the security of these applications. And as usual, we, have, uh, we will hear from the IAEA about the support uh, its highly skilled experts and researchers provide to member states. So this is a hybrid event and uh, we want you therefore to hold your questions to the end. For those in the room, um, our intern Constantine will bring you a mic so that those online can hear the questions. And you have to hold the mic like this and not like this, otherwise no one can hear you. <laughs> and for those in the uh, for those on Zoom, uh, please use the Q and A function um, to submit your questions, and Noah will read them out. And for those of you on YouTube, please submit your questions via events at vcdmp.org. That's events at vcdmp.org. Um, so let's kick off immediately with Rob Elphick. Um, he is South African, who is currently based in Port Elizabeth. He is a chartered accountant by training with an MBA and many years of diverse business experience in multiple market segments and in different parts of the world. He is currently the managing director of, for the RBX Group, which consists of two companies, namely River Bioscience and X Sterile Insect Technique. This group belongs to the Citrus Growers Association of Southern Africa and is focused on sustainable crop protection. Rob. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, it's fantastic to be here and to, and to talk about um, SRT and how the, um, the ionization is, is helping in, in, in South Africa. And really the technology and its future is a very interesting subject and, and, multi, and with a lot of um, different uh, elements that need to be discussed. Yeah. So, so without uh, any further ado, I want to introduce um, EXIT or the SR Insect Technique started in 2007. It was actually a joint project between the Citrus Research International, which is the research arm of Citrus Growers Association in South Africa. The USDA was involved and uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. And they did the research in the early 2000s and it actually started in 2007. It employs 180 people and as you can see we released for for nine months and it's over a large area. You'll see the map on the next page which shows you where we release. And, and we're not only doing it on citrus, we also do it on table grapes in certain, in certain areas. The capacity for us is about 60 million moths a week. It's a lot of moths. You can hear them eating if you walk through the factory. It's quite eerie. Um, and obviously the, at the moment we're not at full capacity. We're doing about 50 million moths a, a week. So. The, where the moths are shown on, the, on this map, you can see where we are releasing around the Western Cape and Eastern Cape regions of Southern Africa. The, the, um, the whole program has been through a number of different um, challenges over the, the years, the 16 years it's been in, in um, existence, and therefore it hasn't expanded into the northern areas, even though there is significant uh, citrus being grown in the northern areas of, of South Africa. It's just stayed in, in, in these um, centralized areas. And as you can see, the release is done by helicopters these days. Um, it's quite expensive, um, or by ground release, um, also as equivalently expensive because it's, it's difficult to get onto farms these days with all the security that is in the play around, but we, we have to do ground release because of the propensity for people to put up nets. So it's it, how it's done. What is it? What are the moths doing? We radiate them at 180 gray, and we release both males and females. So really this is about sustainable pest control. 
And when you look at a, the pairings of untreated uh, moths, each um, pairing will result in up to 400 eggs being laid onto, this, onto the, the, the citrus and at least 180 damaging larvae coming out from each mating. And this is why this, this pest develops so quickly. So what we do is we introduce an overflooding ratio of a minimum of 10 to 1. We actually like to get 40 steriles to every single um, uh, um, uh, wild moth. And we, um, the, the mating that takes place means there is no viable larvae that actually get into the, into the, um, into the fruit. Uh, and the, um, the ability to do this and why we do this is really around um, phytosanitary, uh, this being a phytosanitary pest and, and market access. Market access is so important for, for, for citrus and for other key crops for South Africa. And um, the phytosanitary uh, threshold is zero. So we're not talking about an economic threshold of a pest in an in a orchard causing trouble. We're saying one larva found in one fruit is too much. That's, that's a really difficult thing to do. And this is where SIT gets involved as part of your integrated pest management to try and reach this, um, this, uh, this target. And this target is made more difficult because we've got to keep food safety in, 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 in mind as well. So while we're trying to control this, this pest that is prevalent and, and, and reproduces so much, we've got to make sure we're not damaging the fruit and we're not putting chemicals on the fruit. And when you look at the farm to fork and the, and the green deal, all these things play into the fact that we need to make sure that the fruit is clean when it goes and doesn't have chemicals on it when it goes out. So an inter to do a soft, sustainable approach to reaching these two targets of zero, zero larvae and zero chemicals, you need an integrated pest management situation or a number of layers that will help you protect your fruit and a big part of this, the base of this, is, is SIT. So when we look at SIT itself, the, the elements of sustainability is the diet or the food that the, that the moths um, eat. It's having space for them to grow and to, and to, and to develop in, the, in, in, their, in their own time, because if they get stressed, they, they tend to uh, not live very long. The release mechanism is a, is a key one. We used to use gyrocopters, but they proved to be unsafe. And we have now, we tried fixed wings, and we're now on, on um, helicopters, which are, can fly a bit lower and a bit safer. But the key element of the, of the sustainability is, is, is obviously how do we sterilize the moths? And this is really key because, you know, in the end, we, we need to make sure that we're not putting any non-sterile insects, into, uh, moths, into the, into, the, um, into the orchards. So making sure that that's done properly is, is really, really important. And what does it need? So I told you 180 gray is, is the, the level to which we need to irradiate. We need to do about 10 million a day, 10 million moths a day. And at the same time, keep them healthy. They, they, they need to be cool and they need to be healthy. So you can't take too long to radiate them. So if the source gets a bit old and it takes too long to get to 180 gray, then we have problems with the moths warming up and they start damaging each other or they can even start mating before they've been um, irradiated. And the other key, key thing about this irradiation is that it needs to be available for nine months every day. These, the, these moths, are, it's not a product that can be put on a shelf. It has to be irradiated and, uh, as they are at the right age and then they have to be released into the orchards within 24 hours of being irradiated. So, this really does uh, mean that it's, 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 a, it's a significant effort to get this done consistently throughout the season. So what do we use? At the moment, we're using cobalt-60. Cobalt um, obviously, the International Atomic Energy Agency was involved at the start. They actually uh, helped us with the source um, in, the, in the original um, part of the program. Um, but since we had to replace it because it got too old, um, we, we had to purchase one ourselves for the one and it arrived in the middle of COVID. And the challenges with Cobalt 60 is really the acquisition process and the permits, as you know, it's very, very difficult. The on-site risk of having a source on-site is, is something to think about and obviously security and, and control around your source is very important, uh, as Ingrid was mentioning earlier. A lack of flexibility, which you can't really move it around very easily. Um, or people get nervous if you try to. Um, so the lack of flexibility is something to think about, and then at the end, you've got to, got to get rid of it. And obviously, there's, there's very limited methods in which you can do that. 
And lastly, of course, the cost. As you can see, the, the cost there for, of the new installation there was a, just under $700,000. So that's a big uh, increase in, in overheads or, or uh, cost absorption for, for the, the, um, the program. The other option we've looked at is, is x-rays. And, and once again, um, you know, in, our, in, our, in the research we've done, the high cost of these machines um, is, is a significant issue that's, which would increase the, the price of SIT. The reliability, as I said, we need to do this every day for nine months of the year. We can't miss a day. And, um, and, and downtime or the waiting for spares is a big issue that we haven't really been able to overcome um, in, in our research with this. And then the volume and throughput, in other words, scalability of, of x-rays to make sure that every single moth that you have in your cylinder is actually irradiated correctly and is sterile before you release, this, re release it is, is, is very important to the program. And um, that's something that we, we're still um, looking at and we are working with um, x-ray suppliers to, to try and get this right and, and improve it, but it's, it's not there yet. And obviously a big thing for these machines is that you need a stable and reliable electricity source. And if any of you have visited South Africa recently, you'll know that it's everything but. And in many, many countries in Africa, a reliable, constant electricity is, is not really available. It, um, so this is a big, big issue when we look at X-ray. Not only the availability of, of, the, of the electricity, but the quality of the, of the electricity and the um, the reliability thereof. So with all these challenges that we're talking about, we are with a Cobalt 60 source. Um, and even then, you know, when we look at sustainability of using this for an important um, project or, or important part of crop protection for South Africa, there's some significant challenges for sustainability for SRT as a whole. The technology support, um, as I said, we worked with the International Atomic Energy Agency at the start. But then when we got the new, the new um, source, we had to go onto the commercial market and buy it ourselves. This once again increased, as I said, increases the, the overall cost. We, um, we, we are getting some support on the research with x-rays, but I still think it's quite a long way off. And the electricity issue in South Africa is not going away. So uh, I think we're a bit away there. The funding options is, is really something that, that is a big concern for us at the moment. You know, at the, at the moment, it's really been left to the grower himself to pick up all the costs, and they are spiraling out of control. And there are other options to controlling these moths by using pheromone-based mating disruption instead of sterile insect technique um, mating disruption. So the funding really to make this sustainable in the future needs to be, the growers need to be involved, but we need government and we need um, some, some of the technical support to come and help um, with the costs of doing this. Because remember, this is, the SRT is only part of the integrated pest management program. There's still significantly other things that need to be done to get to those, those targets of zero larvae and zero chemicals. So sustainable crop protection isn't just one thing like a strong chemical that kills everything. That's why it's sustainable. So, but it so therefore needs to be um, uh, multi-layered. So we're trying to get the government involved. Um, it's difficult in, in South Africa. There's a lot of things that they're working on at the moment, um, and they understand, they are very supportive, but is, there's very little funding coming. And the other thing we are looking at is doing some um, uh, IP sharing um, and training for other places that want to do SRT, because really the IP is not in the, in the, um, the radiation process. This is reasonably simple. You do a ca calculation and you do the radiation. The IP for us is in growing 50 million moths every week for nine months in a row, and every one of those moths wants to kill themselves if you upset them. This is really difficult, and we're happy to share that, because that's what we've learned to do really well. So for us, SRT is a very important part of our integrated pest management um, structure, but with the pressures of the economy at the moment and with the, the way we have um, evolved through our 16 years of existence, the, lo the longevity and the, and the future of SRT is very much at risk at the moment. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rob. And now we'll have Dr. Shima Shayan Farr. She is the principal scientist uh, leading the global product development platform at Herbalife Nutrition in California, USA. 
She's also serving as a junk professor at Chapman University. In her previous roles, she led innovation at Califia Farms, global product stability for General Mills, and its joint venture with Nestle, and validated emerging technologies at German Institute of Food Technologies. She comes with international working experience in the US, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East in different roles of research and development, quality control, and project management. And Shima holds a PhD in food science from Texas A&M and has published two books, 10 book chapters, and dozens of peer review articles. Thanks, Shima. Thank you, Ingrid. Hi, everyone. It's a true pleasure for me to be here and uh, excited to share the promising application of this platform technology to you all. As a food scientist uh, who has worked in different parts of the world, I cannot emphasize enough on three factors that make your food business a success. Food safety, quality, and sustainability. And each of them has its own order of magnitude. I would say food safety serves as a core. The mission of you as a food scientist or anyone as a, in food business should be delivering and developing safe food. And if you cannot really deliver safe food, you should not be in this business. You should change uh, your job or think of some other thing. But what makes you comp competitive? Like what makes you stand out in that competition landscape? That is the quality. That, that is the differentiator. And uh, what is going to really drive uh, value and uh, <laughs> deliver more value in terms of uh, uh, your business is how sufficiently you are efficient and how, uh, sorry, how sustainable you are, how efficient you are in thinking uh, critical about how you can uh, save dollar values either by upscaling uh, your uh, waste streams and think of how you can make your whole process efficient. And this technology has shown a promising application to tap on all of these. So this is the journey that we have from farm to flower, but sadly sometimes it ends up becoming from farm to funeral. And why is that? Because there is no validated kill step on flour. Flour is one of the principal items in food industry, uh, and the quality sadly depends on the practices that happens on the farm. We have no control, like what sort of animal might be manured on the farms, and they might bring in pathogens and microorganisms that because uh, there is no validated kill step, there is no thermal processing in place, uh, the flower uh, turns to be sometimes harboring some of those pathogens. And as much as it's communicated, please do not consume it raw, this is the reality. In 29, we had a huge outbreak uh, because of uh, flower contamination. And in 2016, another one. And guess what? A week ago, we had another outbreak, this time with salmonella. Why does history need to repeat itself? Coming to quality is not any better. We see about one third of fresh produce is wasted in the US. In that case, talking about berries, there is no processing in place simply because introducing any moisture or any washing step is going to cut down the amount of shelf life and shelf life means money. We don't want this to happen. Sadly, by 2050, we are going to have about 10 billion people living in this world, which means we need to have 25% increase in our food supply. And taking into account that much of waste is nothing that we can really afford. And uh, given the fact there is no step in terms of like ensuring the safety, uh, it's up to your luck. Like One of those berries might be contaminated. Either you get it or you miss it. So how does industry go about that? Well, they rely on temperature, thermal treatment, but the challenge is that uh, you end up with overprocessed food. Sometimes you don't get to enjoy the taste of the freshness of the food because it's overprocessed, it's overcooked, it's not nutritious enough. And uh, days by days, consumers get more aware about like uh, what are the rights, what they want, and uh, for being relevant in the market, you need to address those needs. This is one example of how Electron Beam can uh, be promising here. In that case, uh, take uh, one serving size of strawberry, fresh strawberries, about 150 gram. And if you just give it one single dose of one kilogram, which is nothing, you can get 4.5 log reduction of E. coli. But what does that mean? What is the risk associated with that? 
if you do some uh, calculation of risk assessment uh, based on the QMRA, and it also depends on the initial contamination level, uh, let's say you have about 100 uh, living cells of E. coli, five out of uh, about 10,000 people will definitely get sick if they consume one serving of strawberries. If that concentration increases up to 100,000, two out of 10 people definitely will get sick. But what if we apply one kilogram of EB? About four out of 100,000 people will get sick. And in that case, that is only 100 uh, cells of E. coli. We only have four people out of 100 uh, million people will, uh, will get sick. What is the risk assessment? About 99.99% risk reduction. Isn't it considerable? So why does that happen? If you consider electron beam or any of the ionizing radiation, the mechanism of action is basically simply be either based on the dose, either breaking down system or scissioning, or reinforcing structure or cross-linking. And each of them may have different application. And in that case, polymer does not necessarily mean packaging. Polymer could be protein. It could be carbohydrate. So you can think whenever you need more resistance and more durability, you apply doses that you have cross-linking, whereas in some other cases, you think of degradation. Can you think of an example where cross-linking is more efficient, more helpful, more promising? When do you think you need more cross-linking? Packaging material? When you want to build more resistant and bio-based uh, packaging material, that would be your best bet. But when it comes to degradation, think of all the agricultural bio waste that we are throwing out or living, um, living to uh, the farm in order to be fed to cattle and animals. It's not going to be helpful because each of them carries a lot of nutrients that can be extracted. The beauty of this technology is that open up this structure so you can use those nutrients either as uh, intermediate material for any fermentation into biogases or just extract them for uh, phytochemical uh, benefits of them. Shelf life extension is the minimum value of this technology. And of course, the fact that this technology is a non-thermal processing technology, meaning there is no elevated temperature, well, it's obvious that it's going to ensure more sustainability, which are, I would say, of less important compared to all the other four. Uh, talking about uh, the agricultural waste or sustainability in that case, most of the agro waste, they carry a lot of uh, cellulose. Uh, it's a material that is uh, having this potential to be fermented to biogas. Uh, the challenge is that you need to break them and this technology helps you break down those, all those complex structures into uh, easier material to be fermented. And, but the reality is that most of these bio waste or the side streams of industry, if at all are going to be upcycled, they are used for some product development efforts. But the question is that in that case, they have used apple pomace, that is the side stream of uh, apple juice production in order to develop another snack, extruded snack. But is that the smartest way you can look at uh, waste management? What if they had like extracted those phytochemicals and use it for other applications? Here is another example how food industry is uh, working at this point. Again, introducing the same apple pomace into bread, hoping that the shelf life is extended and you are uh, delivering more value in terms of having a more enriched food. But the question is that, why not this? Why shouldn't we use this technology to extract the uh, value-added products and this is exactly the product that you can get on Amazon for $14, it's only 100 gram, which most of the time is fed to cattle. That is the, another example, another dietary fiber that could have been extracted using this technology instead of just putting onto landfill. Talking about the bioethanol and uh, all the biogas being uh, developed here, we see the application of this technology, how it could increase the yield of uh, the biogas, which is a more sustainable option. So with that being said, if you want to know more about the technical piece of that, uh, there are references that uh, we have put together and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shima. Now we get to Kamran Nadim.
He is the Director of Business Development of Puck Electron Beam Irradiation and he will offer a case study of technology adoption by private industry in Pakistan. He is a food scientist and technologist qualified uh, in the United States with over 25 years of professional experience in the private sector um, of food and allied industries in Pakistan. So he has served as a consultant for numerous projects. As a research scientist, he's, he has a keen interest in applied e-beam irradiation technology for food, safety and security, aimed at preventing and reducing post-harvest losses of food. He is also involved in other research projects related to the application of e-beam technology. Thanks, Haman. Thank you for the introduction, Ingrid. Good afternoon, dear panelists. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. I'm, as Ingrid mentioned, I'm going to give a brief uh, a success story uh, for the e-beam plant that we have put in in Pakistan uh, as a private sector investment. It's like a dream come true. The overall objectives for this plant to put this plant in was uh, the reinforcement behind this was mango exports from Pakistan. Mango to the United States, uh, Pakistani mangoes are being loved and uh, being uh, appreciated. It, the cost value of Pakistani mango, each Pakistani mango is about 4.5 US dollar uh, to a regular mango, which is 45 cents. The problem that we were having in sending mangoes is America would only accept mangoes which are irradiated and by and not hot vapor treated or not hot, vapor, hot water washed. So uh, we looked into it and from Pakistan we would be sending the mangoes and taking the uh, you know by Emirates or by Qatar Airways who are the best served airlines the mangoes would be transported to the US stations and it would not go inside the US territory it would be quarantined either at Mississippi or at Texas A&M University for EB or the gamma radiation until unless it would be treated it will then go inside uh, the for the distribution within the United States so this was the prime, uh, you know, the reference or the prime objective of laying our, our plant. Then we did the need analysis. We did the need analysis uh, because the company that I am belonging to is a sister concern of a mother group who is already involved into supplying uh, dehydrated fruits and vegetables and spice products to A and B class. I say A and B class means meaning export-oriented companies from Pakistan and uh, mainly exporting herbs and spices. So we need, uh, we decided that, uh, we, we thought that there is a need because there was a lot of pressure coming in that they did not want the consumers or the regulatory bodies in, in, in Europe and uh, in USA and the Western developed countries. Uh, they were not looking for anything which is treated with fumigants like uh, methyl bromide or ETO techniques. So to discourage these techniques, we had to look into some alternate techniques. Uh, one of the other techniques which was available and we researched, we, we found out that it's the radiation technique. Radiation technique, gamma radiation plant was already present in Pakistan. Unfortunately, getting more into gamma resource is, uh, was a technical, is a technical problem, technical issue. Because uh, first of all, gamma stone or the cobalt 60 is like uh, having a sorosis stone and because of the nature of Pakistan's geographical uh, location, it wasn't easy for us to get the gamma radiation. So we looked into the other alternate techniques available and it was E-beam that we had decided. Our concept started to put down this plant in 2012 then we started searching for the suppliers in 2012, the same time. The construction of this plant started in 2016 and the project executed in 2018. I would mention the construction of this plant is very complex and it was like laying out an emperor's fort or a Taj Mahal, uh, having 30 meter high uh, ceiling 
and three feet wide uh, the, the walls of the bunker. For the project, when we estimated, that was back in 2016, the land we acquired was about an acre or about 4,047 square meters. Uh, the construction cost, the land cost of us at that time was 325,000 US dollars. The construction cost was 175 million US dollar. The plot, uh, the plant estimated to be at that time was about 2 million US dollars. The utilities were about 245,000 US dollars. And the payback period that we targeted at that time was five years. The challenges, the potential challenges that we faced was the first, the choice of supplier. Being a private enterprise, we had the first uh, challenge that we were not entertained or we were not taken seriously by many of the world's suppliers, the leading suppliers. From many of the, being in the uh, underdeveloped country or the developing country, and also a geographical uh, standing of that country, geographical position of that country, would not let us get into uh, integration with any uh, European or the Western suppliers who are the leading suppliers in the market. So our choice was limited since our dream was so high and we really wanted to get into it. So we uh, wanted to have it as, as, as soon as possible. We were eager. So uh, we had chosen a different suppliers from the other location of the world. The complex structure, the complex construction design, as I mentioned, is like building an emperor's fort. The technical experts, there was next to none availability of technical experts in Pakistan. Then we had uh, an awareness of this technology because when you go out to the government bodies, you go out to the, to the regulatory bodies, they were primarily uh, unaware of the application of this technology. And we did not have any country regulations uh, for e-beam technology to bring into practice. So if to import the, material, the equipment in Pakistan, it was a big challenge for us because first of all, in customs, there was no endorsement that such kind of material is existing and which HS code would apply and so many complications were there. The way we uh, tackled challenges is I got into the lobbying with many of the providers and seeing my interest in, in this technology, uh, they helped me getting the material from indirect sources in Pakistan. I, we had tremendous vendor support and without this support, it would not have been possible that they actually uh, came to Pakistan, is, were stationed in Pakistan for two years and had their uh, manpower available for us for continuous two years from different sectors like the technical one and the civil ones. The awareness, uh, we brought the awareness after when before we were putting in the plant during the transition phase of like 2016 and, and 2018, we started doing strong awareness uh, and going door to door uh, to the to the companies to the to this uh, to the customers and one of the major challenges we faced was like no two competitors would sit on a table for a seminar so we went door to door and designed the system and tailor made our awareness programs and the need analysis for each customer to convince them for the need then we also ran the free of cost trials validation of any any product for e-beam even if it's being done by gamma treated uh, by gamma treatment or by other treatment but the alternate treatment has to be validated and and calibrated verified also so we did free of cost trials as a service provider we are not supposed to do any free of cost uh, any any design trials but we did go into it then we started uh, dialoguing with our regulatory authorities and luckily, 
uh, we got the endorsement of e-beam uh, technology in our uh, uh, in our regulation regulation for Pakistan by PNRA. Then the regulatory uh, status uh, as a it it was a put it into into a regulation for import. It was a big challenge, and it got endorsed. Then came the time. Our awareness, our trainings, our, our interest was going in vain during the COVID times. So we had to find a way or otherwise we would have been disabandoned from the market or technology would have failed. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, there came COVID times. And COVID times, we found another uh, requirement. And there is a saying that there is always room at a top. And you, uh, you, you have to overcome your fear, otherwise the fear rides over you. So believing in that thing, we went into the transition phase and we looked, we looked into the other frontiers. We started doing the sterilization of, of the pharmaceutical <coughs> items, simple items like gowns and so, where uh, the other treatments were time consuming and people wanted and the consumers wanted the results right away. So we started treating the pharmaceutical items like gloves, gowns. We started treating the, the medical devices. We started treating the pharmaceutical active compounds of the pharmaceutical ingredients. We started in, uh, doing the, the, uh, the frozen items. Uh, which was not being taken uh, place beforehand. The pet food, the pet treats uh, being exported from Pakistan. And then, last but not the least, the precious stones coming from Pakistan. So we entered into other frontiers. There is always room at the top, we believe in that. <laughs> the domestic impact of this technology that, that we had was the logistics. Our competing uh, body, which is a gamma radiation plant, and now there's another e-beam plant, uh, is near the dry port. Our vicinity, uh, the choice of the facility has been smart in a sense that we were, uh, we are located in Karachi city, which is only, uh, which is served by four seaports. And one of the seaport, the farthest seaport that we have is about 25 miles from our vicinity. And the airport is only 15 miles from our vicinity. So it, it uh, attracted all the exporters from around the, around the country who wanted to export and who were getting their products rejected from, uh, from export. So they would bring in the container to our facility and for every frozen item, we would treat it and uh, it would take about two and a half hour uh, to three hours, uh, including the unloading, uh, the treatment and the loading of the container. So that facilitated. So for the, it, it really uh, saved the cost. With the e-beam, the beauty of e-beam technology is like you don't have to open the product. You don't have to expose the product. There is no residual of the product inside. There is no elevated temperature. So you treat the product inside the box and you can take it out. Logistics saving was very much there. We had the cost saving, and uh, we had the, uh, definitely it has uh, boosted the exports from Pakistan, not only the local market, but the exports. It's a green technology. Current activities that we are involved in. We need to just wrap it up. Yeah. Current activities we are involved in is spices and herbs, pharmaceuticals, packaging industry as Dr. Shima mentioned uh, the polymer cross-linking uh, to strengthen the polymers and uh, also to sterilize the, the packing devices and the precious stones. Strategies to adopt for anyone, we are ready to collaborate with anyone uh, from the developing countries especially. Uh, strategies to adopt for e-beam to bring in first the current need analysis is a must. So because we did the need analysis based on food only, we did not think of the pharmaceutical product, we did not think of the other product, but along the lines, we did think of it. The awareness seminars, 
there is no enough awareness, more and more trainings, more and more awareness. The, uh, the project location, the vicinity of the project is very important, is very critical. The choice of the supplier is also very important. Luckily, we have been supported by our supplier, the expert construction team, and uh, expert. Strategies to adopt e -beam, expert operations team, and expert inner team. Patience is the key word. Even if we uh, shoot for the moon, even if we fall, we will land in the stars. Future opportunities, we are ready to collaborate with anyone for, for research. And we are a very much research-oriented company, along with commercial viabilities. Need more R&D for local manufactured products. And we are available for research. Take home message, e-beam is a green, safe technology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamran. Um, and so now we'll have uh, Selina Horak. She is the head of radiochemistry and radiation technology section in the Department of Nuclear Applications at the IAEA. She has more than 30 years of experience on, on the field of radiation processing for healthcare, food and agriculture, environment and industrial applications. And before joining the IAA in August 2019, she was the manager of the Radiation Science and Technology Center in CNEA, Argentina, and professor in the nuclear engineering program and nuclear applications specialization at the Saint Martin University. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and share with this amazing panelist uh, the, the session. So I'm going to give you an overview of IEA and what we are doing and what we can do in the area of radiation science and technology, especially related to this uh, ionizing technology. So just to remind everyone, no, IEA has three main pillars. No, the, of course, safety and security, safeguard and verification, and why I am here that is related to the science and technology. And this science and technology, it is mostly spread into these five main areas. Health, environment, water, food, and industry. And we can, well, surely say that radiation technology can contribute to both all of these areas. And I'm going to show a little bit of how we are contributing currently on this area. But first of all, we know that this looks like on the first side that it's like a puzzle, no? It's a crossword that is IEA mandate and is our group who is trying to put order in this kind of puzzle, no? And this is what I'm going to try to show how we are doing this order. So how we are working to put this order, no? In, the, in this puzzle. So we work from the R&D, from the conceptual idea to the transfer of the technology, covering all the different steps to mature the technology. To, but of course, there are many groups in IEA that are working together to make it possible. We start working on the technical departments, in my case, it's the nuclear application department, that are starting with some R&D, no, that are the CRP, no, the CRP are the coordinated research projects that are implemented to go from this conceptual idea to potentially to the pilot scale technology to verify that the technology is working. If this is achieved, when we can go into the transfer of the technology, and this is where DC, the Technical Cooperation Department, is in place and can help the member state in implementing this technology. So this is how we are working, through different mechanisms, but we work together in a coordinated way in order to go, as I said, from the, the conceptual idea to the transfer and potentially to the commercialization, supporting, of course, the member state and the, the, the different groups in, the, in each country to implement coordinated the, the, the technology. So in the area of health application, this is how I, I was saying, no? we put some Norway, we try to enable the country in implementing this technology. In the health, there are two main areas no? that we are supporting. 
in the sterilization of healthcare product, uh, or maybe the contamination of raw material, the sterilization of medical device, tissue allograft, the different packaging material, even toys, no? well, pet food, as has, has recently mentioned. So the sterilization, mm -hmm. we can provide some support to the member state in mature this technology and make it available for everyone. Also in the case of advanced biomaterial, of course, Chima has shown no, the different effects that we are expecting to produce in the, in the different material. No? There are cross-linking, there are degradation, and now we can mention that there are also grafting, no? and there is an oxidation. There are other effects that now we can say that can be used in a very useful to functionalize different material. And how we are implementing uh, action on that? Supporting member state in the R&D now, in some cases from the very beginning stage, but in some others, no, in a more advanced way. For example, well, we are working with, in general, these are CRP, this is our coordination research project that involve around 15 to 20 countries around the world that are working together to obtain coordinated results, no, and compar comparable results. In the area of nanotechnology, we are having a very nice result from these countries, and we are producing now one publication on that, on the area of uh, the radiation effects of polymer material, especially in this case, uh, my colleague Valeria that is here, uh, what it is, the main focus is to see which is the difference among gamma, X-ray, and e beam how this effect is reflected in the polymer, especially for healthcare products, this material that are uh, conforming the, the devices. And next year, we are planning to launch another CRP on biomaterial, the synthesis of new biomaterial, no? using this kind of technology. In the area of food application, of course, it has been mentioned very clearly, uh, the radiation for sanitary purposes, but also for phytosanitary purposes. Of course, the sterile insect techniques that uh, has been mentioned, and also my colleague here, Rui Cardoso, who is the section head of this area, very clearly are co coordinating the action on that. Surface disinfectation, there are some low beam technology now in place with some very nice pilot uh, machines that are disinfecting the surface of seeds, for example, or eggs, and it's very useful also as well. A mutation breeding, that is another kind of application, and there are many different CRP on, the, on this regard. This is, be, this is coordinated by my co our colleagues in, in NAFA, and this is the, the joint FAO IEA division. In the case of uh, industrial application, sorry, the animation, I, I forget to <laughs> remove it. So in the case of industrial application, here is the polymer modification mostly cross-linking, coating, curing on surface, crafting polymers, degradation of polymer. Um, we have two main CRP ongoing. Uh, one is in the crafting of membrane for cleaning and sustainable energy. We are, for example, producing some uh, membrane for fuel cells, another for catalyst for biodiesel. So it's quite exciting what uh, the results that are being obtained through this kind of uh, coordination action. And the, this, the, the last one that has recently been launched on the use, and thank you, Jima, because you introduced the, the topic as well, the use of biomass for synthesis of bioplastic and other components, such as the, the use of this biomass for bioenergy, bio, <coughs> biofuel, bioethanol, and so on. So this has been recently launched and is completely in line with your topics. So um, this is another, sorry. Uh, Sorry, Selena, what is bioplastics? Bioplastic is plastic that are being produced for natural sources. And can be natural broken polymers. down easily. Exactly. The idea is to have this bioplastic in order to be biodegradable, easily to biodegradable or easy <coughs> to recycle. That is the, the main purpose. The other application will be on preservation of cultural heritage. Radiation technology also is very useful on this, on the disinfectation of some different artifacts, or also in the consolidation, where you are, especially wooden artifacts can be impregnated with some resins, and the cross-linking is in the artifacts to preserve it in the time. For example, this uh, ship in the, in, the, in the picture has been consolidated by radiation technology, 
and it was very deteriorated because it was uh, under the one river, and we could, uh, the, well, our colleagues in France could make it uh, possible to, to, to reconstruct it and, and consolidate it. And we just launched one CRP. Actually, this week, the around 20 uh, member states uh, are meeting in, in Cairo on this uh, new CRP uh, with the uh, participating of museum, conservator, museum, uh, restorator, to try to agree on which are the, 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 the mechanisms through which we can apply this technology. The environmental application, another very, very well-known technology that can be achieved through this uh, radiation technology, the treatment of flue gas treatment, the industrial wastewater treatment, the sludge hygienization, recycling of waste. These are the main areas in, in which radiation technology can have a very, very good advantage. And in most of these, also EVing can be more useful because of the continued treatment of this kind of effluents. Uh, sludge hygienization, nevertheless, there is one a facility in India that is using gamma, but of course, it is up to the <coughs> member state and their interest of interest who will be the which will be the, the best technology. But this is just to give you an idea. And again, we are having some research coordination meeting related to this to try to verify that the technology is useful. No, in this case, we are well. Just one recently closed CRP on the inactivation of biohazard. The, the other one is the removal of emerging organic pollutant from this effluence. And the last one that is connected was one of the flagship initiatives of the IAS, that is the recycling of polymer waste for the structural and non-structural material. Also, radiation technology can contribute to these kind of topics. And again, we are also not just in the R&D area, also we are supporting member states in, well, improving their existing radiation technology in, in, in the country, but also if there is an interest in moving into the, from gamma to EBIN or create one EBIN facility or another gamma as well. So we are supporting, providing the expertise, providing the resources in case that they have some national project. Uh, and also we are trying to help them in the quality management system, such as uh, using some intercooperation uh, exercise that can compare you know, the, 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 the aptitude of different uh, uh, in, in place uh, dosimetry system and so on. And well, if there is a need on safety and some guidelines, we are producing some guidelines on the area of, for example, setting up different facility. Uh, in the case of uh, recycling, for example, Recycling is one of the flagship initiative. I'm going to comment on that later on, and I will let you what is the kind of guideline that we are producing. And as I said, IEA has three main flagship now in place. Rays of hope related to the assistance of the nuclear medicine, zodiac for zoonotic diseases, and nutec plastic. That is to, well, as it is called, nuclear technology for controlling plastic pollution. And this uh, flagship, the NUTEC, is where the radiation technology has a, a key role. And this is an overview idea, very briefly, to sh explain what is this NUTEC flagship initiative. It has two main components. The first one is how to try to find some innovative technology to recycle and to keep the plastic in the change, you know, in, the circular, in the circularity as much as possible. Uh, and the second component that is how to monitor the microplastic in the marine environment. So we are coordinated action in order to try to support member states in developing the technology in both areas. And in my case, we are directly related to the what it is called plastic recycling uh, or, and producing, uh, pro, pro, generating bio sources. And to implement this action. This is a good example of how IEA is coordinating the mechanism that we have in place uh, from going from the interest from the member state, going to the conceptual idea, to the potential commercialization. And this is 
and a scale that is the TRL scale. This is the technology rate, not the level that we are, well, supporting the country from the very beginning idea, from the conceptual idea to the pilot scale plan. This is our main achievement through this new tech plastic initiative. And then, of course, expecting that the country can complete the commercialization step. So, but this is the step that we are coordinating in order together within our uh, technical department plus the technical cooperation department to make it possible and in a very continue, continue process. And this is just to illustrate a little bit what is the, how we are reporting the activity that we are doing related to this nuclear, uh, Nutec Plastic Initiative. There is one dashboard where we are uh, Exponing, but this is the idea. It's, it hasn't been launched yet. It's going to be very soon available for all our member states. But the idea is to have here in one nutshell all the information that is being conducted related to this new tech plastic initiative or upcoming event and so on. So we are working, IEA are working to try to enable member states to achieve the sustainable development goals, mostly these nine sustainable development goals, but indirectly there are some others that we are also supporting, so we try to encourage all member states to take advantage of this. And just to do some kind of advertisement of our <laughs> <laughs> core uh, conference and events, in 2025 we will have the uh, ICAST 2025, this is a a conference that we had last year, and it was very, very, yeah. Uh, Sorry? That yeah. Uh, it's, it has been very, very successful because we can connect industry, private sector, academia, everyone are here and from developed and developing country. Everyone are here, no? And connecting action have the chance to, to, to interchange uh, knowledge and so experience and so on. And of course, the accelerating conference that is going to be in 2026 that also is connected to this accelerating technology. And with that, thank you very much. Open for questions. Thank you so much, Selena. And before we open the floor for um, questions, um, I just want to use my, my misuse my um, position as the uh, chair to, to ask a couple of questions. Um, I mean, we've seen now that there are multiple applications of uh, ionizing technologies um, and how they contribute to currently to trade and to food security, food safety, um, agricultural development. And then also the opportunities that these technologies hold for recycling and for waste uh, reduction. Um, and also that there are exciting opportunities for industry. Um, and from what we see is that uh, this is largely um, related to the, the sustainability of the technologies and, and these opportunities. Um, comes with uh, the e-beam um, technologies, uh, the machine-based technologies largely. Um, and, and my question is, because I think this is what diplomats, especially from developing countries, are, are asking um, often is how viable are these technologies for developing countries? Um, where we have, as Rob has indicated, you know, challenges with uh, a quality supply of electricity, um, spare parts. So my question to, uh, to, to all four of you is um, what, what is your answer to that? Um, how do we, uh, is, is it, uh, Rob, perhaps you can tell us because uh, as, a, as a first uh, respondent, um, people would say generators, you could use generators to, to <coughs> overcome that electricity challenge. So if you could tell us a bit about that and, and, and your experience, whether that, that works. Um, yeah. Well, mainly around that is just you, you're piling expense onto expense and it's, it makes the, the program uneconomically uh, uh, un viable. And, and really that's, uh, when you look at it, uh, our plant is open for 365 days, although we only deliver moths for nine months, but we have to keep the temperature at 28 degrees. 
and all the time, so the moths will, will develop at the optimal um, speed and, at the same, and, and consistently. And this is a problem because the outside temperature goes from minus 9 degrees at some part of the season to plus 45 degrees at other times of the season. So we're already using generators extensively just to keep the, the, the temperature under control. A huge um, uh, air conditioning system that has to manage it. So now to add on the, 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 the X-ray machine on top of that, it is, is just drives the cost to a stage where the, the, the whole supply chain can't manage that anymore. So it really comes down to, to, to cost, and, then, and obviously having the, the, the uh, cobalt source, obviously once you've invested, there's very little maintenance that needs to be done until, until it, it reduces in its uh, strength, that you can't use it anymore, or like I said, it takes too long to irradiate the moths. So, and the challenges with cobalt, as we know, is that uh, there's a projected short supply of cobalt, uh, there's tightening restriction in the transboundary shipment, and there's security risks related to cobalt-60. So um, how, how do we bridge that gap? Um, Shima, do you have any? Sure. To your point, yes, uh, historically, cobalt-60 has been considered as the gold standard for this technology. But the advancement, today's advancement in uh, machine-based uh, sources of energy have proved that uh, we need to be more mindful about the consideration, as you mentioned. Uh, but also uh, it has a lot of data supporting that uh, the efficiency of these modern, ba I mean, machine-based technologies are equal, if not superior, to gamma-based, uh, given the fact they are relying on electricity. So I'm sorry about what is happening in South Africa, but <laughs> considering electricity as the more sustainable source of energy, uh, I believe that uh, opens up more opportunities in terms of uh, application of this technology with promising application. What is missing is the education. Like, uh, what does it take to transform from gamma to x-ray? What are some of the implications? Uh, maybe uh, if they are educated about the benefits, the trade-offs about, like, uh, what does it take to switch the sources of energy? I guess that's going to make it more uh, easy transition from those sources to more uh, I would say sustainable sources. Thank you, and Kamran. I uh, do endorse what uh, Dr. Shima has said and what Rob has mentioned uh, for the sustainability of uh, the resource. And uh, as we are running the e-bean plant, the prime resource that we are dealing with is electricity. So though we have acquired a substation, uh, an additional resource from the for the electric power, uh, but still. Uh, because of the electric failure, we have to install the generators. Through the generators, definitely we have to pass this cost to the consumer. We have to embed this cost in our present costing system. So if there is a way that it can be subsidized or something to promote this technology, this healthy technologies, yes, it, can, it, it will be through. And I think it's, uh, it's true for all the, all the new coming technologies. Uh, it, it can include the car negative, uh, I mean, the carbon ion technology or the gamma technology or the e-beam technology. E-beam technology to say the most. So just can I go back for a second to you, Rob, because you were saying that um, for you to, to transfer that cost onto the um, citrus industry becomes problematic and there are other options for, um, uh, this, um, for integrated pest management. But uh, if I remember correctly, you once told me that um, the use of uh, sterile insect technique is actually a requirement to get into certain markets. It, it's, it, is a, uh, it was a requirement, a very strong requirement at one stage. And in fact, that's why the US uh, Department of Agriculture was involved in establishing this program in 2000, early 2000s. They wanted the, uh, uh, obviously wanted the fruit protected, so they wanted clean fruit coming onto their, sh onto their shores. And they also wanted to know that the technology to do this for false codling moth is, is, uh, is available somewhere in the world in case false codling moth established itself in the, in the, in the USA. So, so um, but that has changed over the years a little bit because of the availability of pheromone-based mating disruption. First of all, it's become a lot more widely available and the prices are actually coming down, whereas the pricing pressure on the sterile insect technique is actually going up. 
So the sustainability of the use of this technology in that is, is, is where this crossroads coming. Unless there's support from, like I said, multi-level support from government, um, technical suppliers and, and the producers involved, it's going to be difficult for this to, to be maintained. So technical suppliers, do you mean like the IAEA support? The support or, or, the, or the e beam when it comes available, you know, um, the, the levels of radiation that you're talking about, I think it's a bit lower than what we do, <laughs> significantly. Yeah. So getting that irradiation with x-ray at the moment, like I mentioned, consistently through all the insects at the same time is, is still quite difficult. We find cobalt is obviously better at that, at, at this stage. So, yeah, we, con we continue to do this research and some of the suppliers are actually working with us on that research in South Africa to, at the moment. But some of, our, some of the other obstacles are just as big to, to overcome as, as getting there. But we're still supporting trying to get that technology to the level where we can uh, apply it if the other pieces of the puzzle fall into place. Selena, do you have anything to add on that? Well, actually, as I hear, we have a neutral position. We are supporting all the different technology. Nevertheless, we identify that this is something that has a high interest in our member state. And just to share with everyone, we have one new project that is to have a, a, a new EBIN facility in Seiberdorf. So especially because we identify that not only the electricity, that is correctly what the Rob have said, that this is an issue, no? the, the, how stable this electricity is and how influencing the machine, but also to train no? educational, no? some training on people who will operate this machine. No? We are encouraging, we are showing that this technology is very useful for one gap that we would like to fill is that we would like to train operator on the basic maintenance of this machine. That is one of the big issues that we have found, that uh, there is a lot of facility around the world, but the main problem is that we need some facility where the new operator can go and yeah. have some hand-on training. And this is what we are planning what to you, have yeah. in Cyberdorf. And so this is how the IAEA is investing even on that level of supporting member states exactly. and, and industry as such. Exactly. Um, questions from the audience? Yes, Facundo. We'll start with Facundo first and then uh, we'll have uh, Norton after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. And thank you, BCD and B for arranging and setting up such an, an interesting and uh, diverse uh, uh, panel of speakers to, to, to present and to address this, this issue. Sorry, Fakuna, can you introduce yourself? Just well, before well, you speak, just introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, my name is Fakuna Delucci, I'm, I'm from, from Argentina. Uh, and, uh, I, I've been involved many, many years working in, in, in my country, trying to, to promote different technologies and to uh, promote the use of radiation in different, different areas. And, it seems that there is a, a specific situation in Latin America in which uh, agricultural production is placed over 60% of the GDP uh, regarding exports of agricultural products, but it's not easy to uh, get the appropriate framework in order to introduce and to promote the application of radiation technology. And I would like you, whatever of you, the four of you, uh, because you have indirectly addressed this issue of how the private sector engaged the public sector in order to develop the appropriate framework <laughs> and uh, connecting the um, uh, demand driven uh, interest to make it sustainable to develop such uh, uh, initiatives uh, in your country. Because I think that there is a huge potential in Latin America, but we are not still achieving uh, that connection in order to link the, uh, po the, the potential that exists because of our natural resources with the uh, private sector initiative in order to develop this, this framework. What would you tell us? About Come on, let's start yes. here. Actually, I gave you a brilliant example of uh, one of the uh, newest or the latest collaboration of this South American gentleman who had been banker, who had nothing to do with the radiation technology. And he has invested, he was convincing uh, 
people to go and invest in this technology. In the span of like last five years, he started his first facility because he was uh, his location was very next to uh, college station, Texas A&M mm -hmm. University. He would bring in the materials uh, like guava, Mexican guavas, and uh, and and mangoes and uh, avocados primarily from this to this facility, and then he got encouraged by. Uh, this Texas A&M University, Dr. Suresh Palai, he opened his own facility at the borders. So it not only saved the logistics, of, because the American border cross logistics is higher, now he can, he can treat his products at the border and he can distribute the product anywhere in the United States. So this is a brilliant example. And the last we met him uh, in, the, in the conference uh, last month in Morocco, and he's opening his second facility. And also the third facility he's opening. He's so much encouraged by this. So this is a... But I think also, example. just to add, because you were saying the challenges you had with the lack of regulatory standards yes. for e-beam technology. And I think that's also the framework that you're talking about, Fakunda, right about you, the legislative and regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. and, and in many countries, we might have the, the regulatory framework for um, radioactive source use, but for e-beam, sometimes mm -hmm. that's a different story. Is that, was that your experience as well? Yes, exactly. And when I talked to Mr. Geraldo, the, the owner of the facility, he faced exactly the same challenges as we did face. So you have to speak to government a lot. You, uh, yes, as private lot. industry, yes. have to do a lot yes. from your side. Yes, and yeah. you have to do make lots of initiatives. Like you put everything in the platter to just like endorse it. But ultimately, financially, and you didn't tell us here, but your 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 return on investment yes. is what within you have a good return on investment. Yes, we did have a good return on the investment uh, because we diversified ourselves to towards medical. And uh, so we had a return of investment, and uh, by next year, uh, we'll be at par. And after, same, after how many years? After six years. Mm -hmm. And Rob, do you want to say anything in that regard? Or? I think, I think the, everybody working together is, is what, how this, uh, our SRT program started. As I said, the USDA was involved, the International Atomic Energy was involved. Our, our government was involved through the um, TIA, which is the Technology Innovation Agency, was also involved. But slowly, they were all interested in getting this started. But it seemed like one at a time, they sort of drifted into the background. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think a lesson for startups, uh, and that is to make sure that there's a sustainable route going forward. And, and once the technology is established and once the research is done, you've got to make sure that, 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 that all the resources are used optimally. For instance, our source was only set up just for us to use. It's in the middle of an insect tree. It can't be used for anything else. So for 60% of the week, it doesn't do anything. And, and, it, and it's losing its power all the time. So how can that be economically sustainable? Mm -hmm. But because the plant was set up as a test and a pilot, and, and, and this specifically, and the source was supplied, no thought was put into how do we what do we do with the source when it's not irradiating the moths? Perhaps that source should have been outside of the plant and have access to have other things irradiated. But it's also in Citrusdal, which is 250 kilometers outside of Cape Town. There's not a lot happening in Citrusdal on a Monday afternoon, I'm going to tell you that. So, so it's not position well. You, you, and um, you were talking about position of your facility is so important. Right. I think this is key in the setup of these projects to make sure you, you, you realize what elements are you going to have and how do you use them optimally. Because at some stage, the sustainability of this thing is going to come under pressure. And that's, and that's what we're feeling as well. And, and really, when you look at it, um, are there other alternatives? Like I said, uh, when X SIT started, there wasn't a lot of pheromone-based mating disruption available. Now it's, it's, it's much more available. So, you know, you've got to ask the question, is it, is it really essential now um, to have it? We would like to have it, but can we afford it? Mm -hmm. And on our own, with just the growers picking up the whole check, I, I think it's, it's under pressure. So sustainability is a very huge issue, yeah. It's a big, and it probably wasn't thought about enough at the time of conceptualization and establishment of the project, which you're so focused on what you're trying to achieve in getting SRT. Because SRT has been used on many different insects, and, and it, it works well, 
and, and you just calculate how long you need to uh, irradiate the insect without frying it, and, 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 and that's done. But the, the, like I said, the, the actual intellectual property in each project is how do you successfully mass rear these insects for such a long time when, especially the false codling moth, um, a lot of these, these moths uh, in the larvae stage, they actually have their own virus within them that they release and kill themselves if they get too hot or too cold or not mm -hmm. enough oxygen. So the IP is really in managing that environment so that you don't end up with a couple of weeks in the middle of the season with no insects to distribute, because that would put an end to your program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Norton? I have a lot to say. <laughs> so, sorry, just Please you know. take the... Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's... it's okay, fine. Norton Titus, I'm at the permanent mission of the media. So you have to... Norton, you have to hold oh, it like this. Oh, okay. Like a pop star. <laughs> so I just want to say to you, Kamran, um, very nice slides you have there. It gives you a really nice uh, roadmap on what to do. would like to get them from you. Um, then also, um, my comment is to say that you, know, you have gamma ray technology and x-rays and e-beams and I think that they, what they do is they, they populate the spectrum of applications. Um, I'm not really one that subscribes to one being better than the other um, because I know with, for example, Cobalt 60, it's got much more penetrative power. Um, my, my question is uh, related to the uh, electricity required to run it. What, what is the typical load um, of an e-beam facility? Um, and also, Rob, considering that your source, um, if I'm correct, is about an order of magnitude stronger um, than the, the X-rays, um, which is about a billion times stronger than the Earth's radiation. Um, but what is your uh, electrical load um, running your facility compared to, to that of the E-beams? Um, and OK, I'll stay, I'll stay here. <laughs> Do you want to start? Our load, uh, electrical load, is about 150 kilowatts. Uh, per hour, oh. one particular or two smoothen that up. We have set up a, a substation of like 500 kilowatts. Okay. On, on, our, on my side, it varies during the year, so it's very difficult to say because in the in the in the autumn and the spring, we don't need to use our, our air conditioners so much, so it varies considerably. Um, and I'm also an accountant, unfortunately, not an electrician. I'm not sure exactly how, how big it is, but we do use a lot of electricity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to give you a, an exact load at, at, at the top of my head. But it does vary through the year. That's but that's to keep the facility yes. uh, and not, not for the actual radiation. But the radiation source doesn't use any electricity. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to follow up? Yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah, that was typically the, the thing that um, with uh, X-rays and E-beams, you really need an electrical source of what is now, kilo, let's say, 500 uh, kilowatts or say one megawatt. Whereas the other one is just air conditioners that's all, that are being yeah, being run. Right. So, right. so in one sense, your whole technology is dependent on electricity. Where on the other, um, I think. Um, the, the cobalt source is, like you said, it's not in use, it's like an aircraft that's standing on the ground, you know, then you're losing money. Actually. So just to say that Norton is from uh, Namibia, yes. because he didn't introduce himself, I think. Did you? Oh, you did. I'm so sorry. You just talk so fast. So now we just have, before we, we go to Susan, we're going to have two, um, we have two questions uh, from our online guests. Yes, so uh, both of these are, I think, quite salient to the discussion that we're having. They're both from, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name, Ramba Rea. Uh, one is uh, sort of a more general question about the acceptability of food irradiation um, mm -hmm. and, and whether or not um, there, are, there are challenges with perceptions to uh, whether or not food irradiation causes uh, health problems, uh, if there are any associated problems with that. So I think that uh, it, would be, it would be worth discussing that a little bit. The other question, also from the same person, uh, a bit more specific about um, e-beams, is uh, uh, how is Pakistan dealing with, with the, uh, the, the challenges associated with using e-beams with uh, high-density materials? Uh, are there challenges associated with that, and how is it that you are uh, contracting? Thank you. Let's start with Shima. Sure. Oh, that's a very common question, pretty much I guess, from everyone. Uh, the answer to that is that at the doses allowed and regulated, in my case, in US and the FDA, and there is a body of uh, research on that and literature, 
there is no uh, harm, there is no uh, effect on the, even the composition of the food item. Like the max that you can apply ionizing radiation being allowed in food is for spices, uh, which is about like, uh, if I'm not wrong, 15 kilogram. And even at that dose, you don't see any changes. For fresh produce, we see that to be around one kilogram. You can agree that basically nothing ever happens. There are lots of uh, examples on that, that even the organoleptic properties, meaning taste, flavor, mm -hmm. color, they do not change. Let it be like a microstructure in the composition. So from food safety and uh, like the safety of the technology, it is a safe technology. It's been there for more than 100 years. So there has been no cases reported that consumption of uh, irradiated food has been associated with any um, health uh, concerning issues. And the other question about consumers' understanding of that, uh, I'm not sure here, but to my knowledge, price is the ultimate thing that consumers care for. Mm -hmm. If you can provide them with uh, nutritious food that is affordable, they're not gonna question anything about that. Like if you go to the groceries and find two items uh, and you know like what you want, you tend to gravitate toward what is more affordable. Like that's a very uh, common thing that we see. So, uh, and if there is any, there are lots of food that have been ionized uh, or been treated with ionization, uh, but there hasn't been any complaint or any item returned for the fact that it's been treated by ionizing radiation. I know that was mentioned by several speakers, but when I saw the question, I thought that that message bared repeating. So thank you. No worries. Okay. And Kamran, yeah? Yeah, I would address the second question, uh, second concern about Pakistan, uh, application in Pakistan. Primarily uh, with our e-beam treatments, we are dealing with B2B businesses. And B2B businesses, they are already aware of this technology. They had been using alternate uh, for sterilization, they had been using ETO or technology, and uh, E-beam is just a replacement, or they had been using the gamma technology. So it's already a validated technology for B2B market. For the polymer cross-linking, yes, we, they are collecting the data. We are also in, into that phase. We are into the R&D, but so far we have no problem from them. Like we are working with very multinationals, and uh, the processes have been validated, validated with the European head offices, and so no problem for that. Thanks. So Susan Ungar, and we only have five minutes left, so keep the question and the answer short, and then we'll do a wrap up. Very short. Um, I don't know if I, I heard somebody whisper, "What is IPAS?" I don't know if you got the answer. It's the. Um, Can you introduce I, yourself? It's on. It's on. Please introduce yourself. Well, oh, Susan Cohen, a uh, technical writer for mainly for the IAEA, but also for other uh, UN organizations. Um, yes, so IPAS missions uh, became very big after 9 11, and mainly it's to advise uh, countries on, uh, at their request on their physical protection. Uh, legislation, uh, IPAS missions are seated in uh, the Division of Nuclear Security, right? We get international experts, uh, legal experts, and uh, safety security experts, and uh, it's to help countries to get the legislation in place and to um, technically also um, assist them in protecting nuclear facilities, material, and also uh, sources. Now my question is on SIT. I can remember um, the, it started with a very big project on the Tsitsi fly. And the um, main feature for sustainability with the Tsitsi fly was that the, fly, the female fly only ever mates once in her lifetime. And also it was um, applied in Zanzibar, so there was a geographical limitation. No fresh flies could fly in. So I wanted to ask you um, how it's developed since then, because the sustainability is not such a given as it was in Zanzibar because of these parameters. Yeah, SIT as, a, as an eradication technique is, is quite very difficult um, because it needs to then you nearly need to go area wide. So you need to put it because there's a lot of wild hosts as well as just your, your, your crops. And um, you know, it, unless the government is involved. If you take the codling moth project in Canada, there's a, there, uh, 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 
can be corrected, but there used to be up to 50% national and local government support for that for that th uh, that um, that program to be able to do more than just over the over the orchards. And then the um, the the uh, producers were actually signed up, or they had to sign. It was a statutory membership that you had to do. This this proved not to be possible with uh, with SRT in South Africa. So uh, what happened is that you get people pulling out as their cultivars maybe become less um, less profitable. They decide to drop something, and they uh, if they choose SRT, then all of a sudden your area wide approach has now got a, a hold in it. And as soon as you've got that, and you see how these insects um, multiply, uh, multiply it's, it's a serious problem. And therefore, you're only working on suppression. We're never really sitting in a situation where we're able to eradicate it. And that's why we see SRT at the moment as only a base of your IPM program. And it suppresses your population, which you do it throughout the season. You start early and you end right near the, the end. And then you use that base, uh, which goes along with sanitation of picking up dropped fruit or uh, fruit that has been already uh, damaged and taking it out of the orchard. Those two are your base. And then depending on the, the, the pressure in your area for the insect, you design your integrated pest management program on those. And for instance, <coughs> use virus sprays for false cotton moth um, after a flight peak. And if you've got a high pressure area, you would probably use mating disruption as well as um, uh, in a sterile insect technique in, in certain orchards. So, you know, being able to eradicate it, like you're talking about there, is, is, is very seldom you can actually get that right. We've got one very good valley where it's nice and compact, and we've been able to drive the numbers down significantly. But it's, we put traps out in the bush, and we're still catching one or two. One or, you know, okay. And if those are around, the ability for this, this explosion to happen, if you take the pressure off, is, is significant. Okay, thank you so much. So we've come to the end uh, of the panel discussion. Um, I'm going to give everyone a chance just to say a couple of lines in terms of this, what the takeaway message that you would like uh, the audience to come away with. And we'll start with Selena. Well, um, I'm happy to be here. And also I would like to everyone that is interested in our activity, just contact us. And also, of course, uh, if there is a country interest, it has to go to the official channel. But we are open and also open to clarify or enable the way that you can yes, reach us and implement the technology that could be yeah, from the different groups on the house. And well, as you have, say, you have seen, it's quite broad, the, the area or the different topic that we can implement and we can contribute with radiation technology. So let's discuss. We are open for your interest on your question. Thank and you. And for private industry to come to you directly through the CRPs. Everyone, yeah. and exactly. And also so just one uh, an additional comment, uh, follow up as Facundo has a request no, about the, the implementing of the technology in Latin America, for example. And thank you for mentioning that, that, for example, we are going to host under the umbrella of the regional project that we are trying to uh, provide the capacity building and the technology in each, considering also the private engagement, we are hosting, for example, one regional workshop in Gerardo's place in Great. this uh, Southern uh, American uh, mm -hmm. uh, new facility having the participant from inspector from the well the phytosanitary uh, treatment uh, organization plus the producer directly there because this is the best way to show and to share the the experience that he could uh, well gain through this implementation so this is just to give you an idea that we are open for this possibility as well. So the engagement of this private uh, yeah, sector will be directly there in place in this facility. Thank you. Kamran? Thank you, Selena, for endorsing the, the comments, uh, my comments I was going to have. Exactly, this is what I feel is like a lack of participation uh, of the parts, uh, lack of col uh, collaboration of the private sector with the regulatory sector, because most of the time messages across to the regulatory sector of the governmental bodies and the private sectors do not achieve anything out of it. So private sectors, as uh, it's not only me, uh, it's the story from Heraldo, it's the story, another story for, from, uh, from South America, uh, Ms. Maria, I forgot her name, 
and we shared this exactly the same story and we uh, private sector was more into the commercial side and the application of it so if we really need if we really look for in my opinion i believe if we re really look for for the fast uh, application of these technology the commercial viabilities of these technology then the private sectors or the commercial sectors have to be involved in in these and thank you very much thank Ingrid, you. for giving me the chance of this forum that's a pleasure thank Shima? you sure so I uh, just want to remind everyone who may have like impact in food business to, uh, the fact that the consumer today is more and more demanding. They want everything, they want all, they want affordable food, they want fresh food, they want nutritious food and safe food. As a food scientist, I've been always trying to look for emerging or alternative ways to make them all happen. I have tried so many non-thermal processing techniques simply because they are more promising in terms of delivering more nutrients food, but uh, the research shows over and over they are again and again gravitating toward um, mixing those technology with some sort of mild temperature in order to have a synergistic effect. Uh, if you're familiar with non-thermal technologies, they are the technologies that ensure safety without necessarily applying any thermal treatment. But among all these technologies, uh, uh, ionizing radiation, as you said, I want to be agnostic on the source of that, but what format or shape it is, it has proved uh, to be very successful in terms of both ensuring food safety as well as ensuring the quality. And uh, I believe that uh, this is the great time. In fact, there is a lot of literature and information out there. So uh, this is a time to embrace this technology and uh, explore all these emerging applications that they are opening different business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rob? Yeah, I think the, the Cobalt 60 source um, is still seen as the, as the best use in, in, in something like sterile insect technique uh, because of the amount of radiation we need to do and the consistency of irradiation that needs to be done. Um, I, Hopefully X-Ray will, will be able to address some of the shortcomings they've had and the research continues. Maybe that will be available in the future and uh, it will make things a lot easier. To, you know, the, 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 the unit could still sit on your desk instead of being in a bunker. But the technology is not there yet. Um, for me, I think the, the take home message is that you know, we've proved that this technology can, can work and can help to protect crop crops and get uh, clean food of high quality out to, to markets that, that want it. But um, it's becoming more and more expensive. And that's, uh, the sustainability of being able to supply that level of clean fruit, um, both from chemicals and from uh, pests, especially phytosanitary pests, is something that just cannot be um, managed by the grower himself. It needs to the, the government to be involved to try and support the market access. And also the guys that are supplying the technology need to stay engaged um, and be part of the process. And I think one of the big things for me in, in, in the situation where I sit at the moment is watch out for alternatives or make sure that the, the, this is SIT as a whole because of the length of the program and the, and the complexity thereof. It's an expensive program. So research alternatives properly first. And also, when you, if you decide to go for it on the insect that you are wanting to target, look at the use of your source. If it's selling idle, it's losing power at the time, so you, you might as well be radiating something. So don't put it in the middle of your insect tree like, uh, like they did in, in our one. It does not really make it very flexible to use for something else. And um, I think if we can do some of those, the, the, the sustainability um, of, these project, of these programs could, uh, could be enhanced. Thank you so much. And uh, before uh, we clap everyone out, I just want to say online we're going to just pop an evaluation form um, in, in the chat um, so that you can please fill in the evaluation form. It helps us to uh, provide you with more and, and useful information and dialogues. And we'll also have everyone in the room fill out an evaluation form if you'd be so kind. So help me to thank the entire panel for coming. Thank you.